Hi, I'm Dr. Anthony Romeo, and I'm honored to be presenting the AOSSM Exchange Lecture, Adolescent Throwing Injuries, Pitch Counts, and Overuse. Why aren't throwing injuries decreasing? This is for the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine 30th Annual Meeting. These are my disclosures, which are updated regularly at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery website. Jeff Passan wrote a very interesting book a few years ago. He spent three years researching why there was so much attention being paid to the baseball pitcher's arm. And as we all understand, the pitcher's arm is the most valuable commodity in sport. In fact, it's five times more valuable than all of the NFL quarterbacks. And we see the value increasing steadily. So this creates tremendous interest in what goes on with the pitcher's arm. Remember half of every baseball team are pitchers. Jeff went on to talk about the fact that he felt the injuries were increasing because particularly in our younger athletes, they were being encouraged to throw harder, faster and younger to be able to get to the top level and become a professional baseball player in Major League Baseball. And this led to a significant increase in injuries that we were all seeing. Other factors include the public's perception of when you get hurt, is that gonna be a problem? And as Chris Ahmad pointed out in his paper that he did for Physician and Sports Medicine, this is about 10 years ago, but we still have patients athletes, parents coming in who believe that the surgery for the elbow could actually help them improve their performance. And if they've had a little bit of pain, let's get it done now so they can get to the next level. And they did not think that pitch counts were significant in terms of a risk factor. This is surprising since all of the information we've provided over the last 10 to 15 years has really tried to help educate the public about some of these issues, but we still see athletes and their parents who come in with these kind of misconceptions. There was a big concern about a UCL epidemic, especially about 10, 11 years ago, the numbers started going up fairly rapidly at the major league level. And it was also appearing in our high school and collegiate athletes. And we did a study to try to figure that out. And when we looked through a very large private pair database, what was remarkable was that the highest increase in incidents was in the 15 to 19 year olds. And this study has been repeated in other areas and other states since we did this, but this was incredible to see this. And of course, these are non-professional, these are before professional, and it was affecting our adolescent kids and their ability uh, to continue to play and to get back to their sport. And the increase was quite dramatic. We know that these problems occur at a specific point in the pitch cycle in the late cocking and early acceleration phase. And we've tried to learn a lot about this so we could try to come up with strategies to prevent these injuries. These injuries that occur in the elbow are typically at the ulnar collateral ligament area and in the shoulder uh, related to labral tears most commonly when the arm is placed in this very difficult position and there's tremendous forces at both the elbow and the shoulder to deliver the ball. What's really remarkable at the professional level is to watch some of our athletes throw pitch after pitch after pitch. And the mechanism looks the same and they throw this in the 90 miles an hour or faster and yet do not have an injury. And that's when we know that every single pitch they generate enough torque at their elbow to tear their ligament. So how do we help our adolescents avoid these injuries and continue to be able to play uh, through this as they get stronger, uh, faster and better at playing this game? As I mentioned with the shoulder, the most common injuries we see are in the superior labrum. The video shows an athlete laying on their left shoulder. This is the right shoulder intraarticularly. The humeral head is above, the glenoid is below. We can see the fraying or the tearing of the posterior superior labrum or the slap tear that's evident. But on the opposite side, the rotator cuff attachment and capsule look okay. So this is an early part of this condition known as internal impingement that happens with our overhead throwing athletes. What's remarkable is every single time they throw, uh, these areas come in contact or very closely in contact. And yet, as we've stated, many can throw for many years without a problem. What happens when uh, something goes wrong? Well, here's an example. Uh, the pitcher goes to throw the ball and the ball goes way outside 
Uh, this is very characteristic of a complete disruption of the ulnar collateral ligament. Other injuries like latissimus tendon tears, they occur at the deceleration phase. So the athlete is able to actually deliver the pitch, but then suddenly cannot throw anymore. These kind of clues help us to understand where uh, the actual injuries occur. What is the effect of pitch count, pitch type, and pitching and mechanics? It was really a big concern, and, and this is from a study that was done uh, 20 years ago, essentially, to try to figure out what was the association between these factors and shoulder and elbow pain in our young pitchers. Of course, it was done by the group uh, led by Dr. Andrews and Glenn Fleissig uh, down at the American Sports Medicine Institute. They followed a large group of players for one season, and they found out 50% of them experienced some shoulder and elbow pain during the season, and there was a significant association between the number of pitches thrown per game during the season and the rate of elbow and shoulder pain. And this kind of work led to a consideration of limiting the amount of pitches to try to avoid injury. And here's just an example of the chart which shows uh, uh, overall uh, how things were uh, laid out in terms of the amount of appearances. The more appearances, the more throws, the more likely there was going to be a problem with the shoulder and the elbow. In addition, this study, which looked at another 10 years later, the risk of serious injury for young baseball pitchers, a 10 year perspective study, what they found out that pitching back to back days, pitching multiple games, pitching for multiple teams within the same season, all were correlated with a significant increased risk fracture, fracture factor of a injury uh, to uh, the shoulder or elbow. Again, related to how many pitches were done. This work uh, led Dr. Andrews and others to put together with Major League Baseball Commissioner's Office, the Pitch Smart website. And this website is a series of practical age appropriate guidelines to help parents, players and coaches avoid overuse injuries. And it's a very valuable reference that I share, uh, especially with my adolescent patients and their families to make sure that they're aware and up to date with all this information. There are a number of sponsors, again, suggesting the validity of the work and the value of the work that's gone into establishing these pitch counts and arrest recommendations, especially for our younger athletes. And the ones that were having all the problems that we saw with the UCL, the 15 to 18 year olds, again, you can see very specific outline of what they should do in terms of limiting pitch counts. And then once they've thrown, what's the amount of rest time that we believe will give a better chance of avoiding injury. And everyone has asked, well, now that we have this, is there a potential association between pitch counts and injury? I mean, we know that pitcher fatigue increases with higher pitch counts. We know that pitching wide fatigue has been demonstrated as a risk factor. And so it makes sense that if you reduce pitch counts and you reduce pitcher fatigue, we should reduce the incidence of injury. Has anyone shown that? Well, very interestingly, we started looking at some of these issues and we, we wanted to show that the fatigue was a factor. We thought maybe as they fatigued, you'd start to see their arm position change and other things. And so we, we created a simulated game model uh, with our younger adolescent players. And then we used video to analyze this very carefully in terms of uh, the way they were throwing. And then we measured the velocity and accuracy. Uh, and we quantified this uh, from these videos. It was a very extensive project that turned out very well. And we had a setup that we would, they would warm up uh, 10 pitches from home plate, and then each inning would be about 15 pitches, and then they take a break and 15 pitches and take a break. And what we found is that the pitchers became progressively more fatigued and had more pain and pitched with lower velocity as the number of pitches increased. Uh, but what was really unique is that the upper extremity kinematics really didn't change that much. What we saw that change was the core. It was the core and the other structures that support that and the lower part of the kinetic chain. And this concept of hip to shoulder separation was really evident, which has been shown before. Uh, but again, along with this fact was the fact that the uh, upper extremity kinematics were staying the same. Our work did achieve the best paper award at the International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, which was in Korea a few years ago, uh, demonstrating that as pitch numbers go up, uh, the fatigue increases and there's an increasing percentage of hip and shoulder separation, giving us some further ideas on what we might be able to do to prevent injury in our younger athletes. 
The other thing that we want to know is how much does pitch counts actually can lead to injury? So how could we figure that out? So we, we looked at injury in youth and adolescent pitchers, and we found that Peter Chalmers at the University of Utah, uh, pitches per game history of injury versus no history of injury was statistically significant, and pitches per year were statistically significant. And what's, again, remarkable, it's not that much. It's 10 more pitches per game or 500 more pitches per year, which most of us wouldn't see to be that much, but it was statistically significant on how this had to uh, correlate to injury. So workload is playing an important role here. Again, we wanted to show that reducing pitch counts really could show evidence that we reduced injury. And Michael Axe came up with a great idea uh, that we worked with them to study. So we, we knew the pitching regulations for Little League Baseball changed in 2007 to an inning limit to a pitch count limit, but nobody had really looked at whether that had changed the way uh, there was an outcome. So we were able to get 638 youths that pitched during this because they keep very, very detailed statistics, typical of baseball at every level. And what we found was 10% of those kids progressed to professional play, which is a good number to remember when you're seeing that 12, 13, 14 year old in front of you. And then what was most remarkable is that most of them were minor league players. And of those minor league players, only about half of them pitched. And the same was true with the major league players. And in fact, out of the 638 youths, only six became major league players, 1%. So again, when parents believe that their kid is the next uh, Clayton Kershaw or one of these amazing pitchers, uh, again, we have to teach them about preventative measures to cause injury. We have to teach them about uh, non-sport specialization and give the kids a chance to, to live their life as a kid. And hopefully they will become a professional, but they shouldn't focus all on that. Among former Little League pitchers who subsequently played professionally, what we found is 23% of those who played as a pitcher required uh, ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction. Zero of the percent that played other position required it. Then we divided up even more to really look at this. And this was the remarkable finding is that if they did not follow the pitch counts and they got to the level of Major League Baseball or Minor League, there was a 50% chance they were going to have an ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction. If they did follow the rules, there was a 2% chance that they were going to have an ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction. So this was clear evidence that reducing the, the amount of pitches could be valuable. And Michael also has, a, if you don't have this, this database interval throwing program after the kids have been heard and been taken out for a while is really a, a very nice uh, paper to use uh, for your athletes if you're managing this part of their care. This was another remarkable study that was done, youth baseball coach awareness of pitch counts and guidelines, and looking at specifically where we're understanding this. So 82 youth baseball coaches were asked a 13 question survey. Um, three out of four responded, Almost a little over half reported always keeping track, a little over half were non-compliant with age appropriate pitch bar recommendations. Only 13% correctly identified the risk factors for overuse injuries and 15% were non-compliant with the age-based recommendations about breaking pitches. Again, I think this just uh, encourages us to uh, continue to educate and help others understand why this is important for our youth uh, so we can make sure to keep them on the field as long as possible. The surveys with regards to the coaches tracking pitch count based on athlete age, as you can see here, uh, as they get older, it appears the coaches are a little bit more involved and keeping track of that. But for our young kids, our nine and 10, 11 and 12, parents and others need to do this to make sure that our kids are not overdoing it. Is there more to the story than just pitch counts? Uh, well, of course there is. We have to define some of the additional risk factors that are all part of this. For one, velocity, velo, velo, velo. That's what the kids talk about. How can I get faster? How can I get faster? And so we looked at the determined some factors related to that. So we looked at pitch velocity, number and type, fastball, curveball from Major League Baseball 2007, 2015. And so you see about 27% uh, had undergone an older collateral ligament reconstruction. Pitch velocity was significantly higher among the pre-injury pitchers than the control pitchers. And although the number seems small, 93.3 uh, versus 92, that's a big number when you're talking about average pitch and peak velocities, uh, that, that can be significant. In fact, when you plot it out on a chart, you can see essentially uh, a direct correlation between peak velocity and pitchers with subsequent ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction. That's why it always makes me nervous when I hear 
about a young superstar coming out throwing close to 100 miles an hour. And my first thought is, well, we'll see how long that elbow lasts in that situation. Remember, uh, it's only uh, you know a short distance uh, from the pitcher's mound to home plate. And if these kids can throw the ball 95 miles per hour, you can see the reduction in the amount of time that it takes to get to home plate. Uh, and therefore, in terms of the batter, it significantly reduces the amount of time they have to actually analyze and see uh, what's coming on with the ball. And actually, Jeff Passan pointed out in his book, and others have too, is that the batters actually probably don't see the ball completely. They recognize patterns of throwing, and they're able to pick that up very effectively and able to swing the ball uh, where they expect, swing the bat where they expect the ball to be. It's really quite remarkable. And if you haven't tried to do that, just even swinging against 70 miles per hour seems pretty scary. And then if you are brave enough to stand in the batter's uh, box and see a 90 mile an hour pitch go by you, it's incredible uh, how well the batters actually were able to hit in that environment. And then here's just, again, support for the fact each year, the average velocity for the entire pitching staff for each of the teams is creeping up faster and faster and faster. And we need more and more kids are going over 100 miles per hour. And we're seeing that. There is so many different programs out there and that's all over the internet. You know, if you want to be the best pitcher in your league, if you want to get to the major leagues, you have to increase your pitching velocity. So we're not going to get rid of this type of uh, social pressure, but we have to figure out how to help the kids uh, prevent this from being such a powerful drive that they're willing to go to the point of injury. Uh, because we know as pitch velocity increases, as these kids start getting up 15, 16 years old, 65, 70 miles per hour, a standard deviation above that 80 to 85 miles per hour puts them in a hot spot. And some of these kids are throwing 90 miles per hour, even by the age of 16. Uh, and that's a tremendous risk factor for injury. And those with a history of injury, again, you see how the graph plots it out. The higher the pitch velocity, the more likely there's going to be a history of injury. This also correlates to weight and height uh, with the increasing age. And so as you see the kids get bigger and stronger, uh, again, the velocity goes up and the risk of injury goes up with all of that, again, comparing it to weight as we see here. There are other factors. Kevin Wilk and his team has done a great job looking at range of motion and others have too. We spent a lot of time thinking that just loss of internal rotation was the key factor uh, that would lead to an increased risk of shoulder injury or elbow injury. And Kevin and his team have a really nice uh, set of papers out there for elbow and shoulder that tell us that the most important factor probably is overall range of motion. And that helps us to understand. So we should have close to the same range of motion on both sides, about 180 uh, arc of motion. Uh, and there will be some limitation of internal rotation because there's increased external rotation. And as long as that balance in place, uh, their risk of injury is reduced. But when it goes, uh, when it changes, that's a big thing that we have to keep an eye on to help our kids to make sure it doesn't uh, become a problem. And they really did an extensive study as you see here uh, 500 plus examination and 296 pictures for eight consecutive years. And uh, this was a very sophisticated study. It's gonna be very hard to duplicate these kind of things. And again, uh, GERD was not correlated with injury as much as a loss in total rotation. So an important screening factor for our athletes. And again, here's the numbers that we see here, total rotation deficit, and you see the 0 0.007 p-value uh, showing how important that is in terms of predicting uh, injury. What about overuse or workload? We're still trying to figure out how to define that. Is it games pitch, innings pitch, pitch counts, type of pitch, add a position play? Uh, there's so many times when the athletes are doing, what about them working out or lifting weights? How does that play a role in all of this? And so it's, it's really hard to know that. We, we looked at how many innings can we throw? Does a workload influence injury risk in Major League Baseball at the highest level? So we analyzed the pitchers from uh, 2010, 2015, determined if there was a risk of subsequent uh, uh, being on the DL uh, with average pitch counts per game, cumulative pitch counts, cumulative innings, or cumulative number of starts. And we look for any reason, especially in upper extremity region, and evaluate all Major League Baseball starting pitchers with at least five starts to see where this number came out. And what we found was that uh, basically that there was no other finding had significant association with being on the disabled displacement for any other reason or specifically upper extremity reasons uh, from 2010 to 2015, including starts, pitch counts, innings, and pitches per start. But what did show up was the total innings pitched uh, significantly associated with uh, the, um, uh, uh, the risk of being on the disabled list. And so 
that's a measure of workload that total innings pitch. And that gives us a kind of an idea of how we have to think about our athletes. I think we've all recognized if someone throws 120 innings one season and they're coming back next season and they're sort of getting up to 150, 180, and they're looking great. We have to be a little concerned that they may not be ready to progress to that high level of a workload one season later. There's more information to learn there. Lower extremity strength and recovery time in youth baseball players is something we've been trying to look at. And it's really try to figure out, it's not just the actual activity, but when they, when they recover, when can they come back and throw again aggressively and see how that all works. And, and this is a study that looked at that. And many people think they could come back the next day or the following day. They're young kids, they can throw, their, our shoulders and arms will be fine. And what they found here, when they actually measured, particularly core strength and leg strength, the required rest days uh, after a significant output was almost three days. And I can tell you, most people never think about it that way. The kid wakes up the next day, how you feel? Oh, I feel great, I'm gonna go out today. And we really don't pay enough attention to how much time it takes to recover. This could be an area of very valuable uh, effort to try to reduce injury if we can get better about the recovery phase. And then what about the unaccounted workload factor of game day pitch counts at high school pitchers? This is a great study uh, that was done. So look at live game pitches, bullpen pitches, and warm-up pitches. Count them all because they're throwing. And so that is some type of workload on their shoulder. The average number of total pitches thrown during a pitcher's outing was 42.4% greater than what was documented in the game. Almost 50% more than what's documented in the game. And out of that, 70% of the pitcher's outings resulted in what would be considered 105 game day pitches thrown, which is at the top or above uh, the level that they should be throwing at. So there really is this added workload that we have to keep in consideration. Here's another way to look at it, the kinematic and kinetic comparison of baseball pitching among various levels of development. Uh, the question is, you know, when the kids get better and better, do they change their mechanics in a way? And this is an interesting study that shows that pitching mechanics didn't change that significantly with level of play, but the velocity keeps going up with each level of increase in play. And it's important that we teach the kids from the very, very beginning proper mechanics. We've seen some of the young kids that don't have good mechanics, but as they mature a little bit and they get in that stride, that's the way they throw. And we have to really help them with their mechanics to minimize that risk. Here's another one looking at pitching mechanics, pitch type, and pitch counts among healthy pitchers and youth. As uh, a study that we did, 295 baseball pitchers from nine to 22 with no history of injury. All the pitchers threw fastballs at maximum efforts, and we used video recording and analysis. The older pitchers pitched with the hand on the top of the ball, maintained close shoulder at heel strike, led with their hips and achieved better hip and shoulder separation uh, as appropriately uh, for the throwing mechanism. And, and this was just seen, uh, again, this is just showing that as they get further along with their pitching careers, they can improve their mechanics and get better and better with the way they throw. Uh, and we look through all of these things and just to look at some of the things that uh, there's a lot of variables here. Hip shoulder separation you see is, is highly statistically significant, maximum knee height, stride length, um, knee flexion, uh, all of these uh, played an important role in the mechanics. So when we put this all together, should we even let our kids throw? Uh, well, of course they're going to throw. So we have to figure out what's the risk factors and we have to prioritize them in some way. Certainly throwing with higher velocity is one of the risk factors. How are we gonna control that? We're probably not. That's just gonna be difficult. Pitch counts, that's something that we can control. That's something that we can work with education and teaching that show that that can reduce the risk of injury. Reducing pitching below 100 innings per year is important. We recently did a study which looked at the potential risk of throwing a complete game. We know when a pitcher on a major league level is going to throw a complete game uh, that they, they wanna stay in there. They wanna take the game to the very end. And sometimes those pitch counts get into the hundreds. And we looked at how many of them actually had an injury versus the ones that didn't have a complete game. And although the statistics were challenged, the, risk, the reality was is we saw an increased risk of injury by doing those kind of, of outings where they're going well over hundred pitches. So something to keep in mind. Pitching on consecutive days, not a good idea or with multiple teams or when fatigued, which we have to do a better job of defining. Um, geography, the kids in the warmer climates are throwing all year long. We need to uh, get, move away from sports specialization at an early age, have them play other sports, give their shoulders a rest for about three months per year would be ideal. And we have to 
look at things that we can actually also intervene. So if they have a loss of total arc of motion, if their mechanics are not good, if they lose their hip rotation, if we see the hip shoulder separation coming on in an abnormal way very early, we can intervene and try to help them to minimize that. And there, there's probably other risk factors and as technology improves, we'll get better at picking those up. So in conclusion, it's not as simple as just limiting the number of pitches per game. Uh, we know that some of the risk factors include that in our youth and adolescents, it's, it's, it is the number of pitches, but also velocity, height and weight as they get bigger, uh, can be predictors of injury. Some of these we can't change, so we have to focus on the ones that we can intervene. Current data suggests a reduction in injury does occur with pitch counts, as we saw with the Little League World Series players. So I really think that's something we should stay focused on. In fact, if we looked at Major League Baseball pitchers, you could think outside the box. And if you take the pitchers that have been injured and the ones that haven't, you could almost come up with a strategy where each game has two starting pitchers that throws about 30 to 35 pitches, and that's it. And they have time to recover it. But they don't have to recover for five to seven days. And about three or four days, they can come back. It would completely change the way we normally do our pitching today. But statistically speaking, I may in fact reduce the amount of injuries that they have. And we should think about that for our kids too. Pitch counts are just one way to reduce injury. We, we really need to check, have a check in place for velocity can't just be all fast pitches as hard as they possibly can throw. We do need to keep track of all throws, including practice, work on their mechanics and try to figure out better how to understand when they've been fatigued. And we see that with overuse or, or their workload. What are the future directions? We need a better way to evaluate the total workload. So as we talked about measuring and calculating all the pitches that are being thrown, we, we're gonna get better and better with uh, our computer enhancement of the evaluation of fatigue. If we know already there's certain parts of the core, but we can start to look at that very carefully and pick up those changes. And that will help us to understand when it's probably better for the pitcher to come out. Enhanced recovery is an is a area that there's lots of work being done. There's all sorts of things that are going on. But I think what these kind of things are going towards, including serum markings of recovery, is essentially a concierge or an athlete-specific program, both in terms of output, workload, and recovery as we get further into the sophistication of taking care of them. And this is going to drift down to our younger kids, too, of course. There's some references that may be helpful for you, some of the things that we've published over the last few years uh, that cover these things. And again, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to provide this AOSSM exchange lecture. It's a real honor to be part of this meeting, and I wish you all the very best in caring for our adolescent and youth baseball players. Thank you.